Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Mark. Turn with me, if you don't mind, to the Gospel Record of Mark and chapter number 3. The Gospel Record of Mark and chapter number 3. Now we're still working on recording and making sure that we've got everything going, right? <clears throat> Good. And so we're still working out issues and trying to do the best we can with what we have. And so we are so thankful you are joining with us now. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel Record of Mark in chapter number 3. We of course are going through this series of the Gospel Record of Mark. Going through it and walking with Jesus through his earthly ministry. And we've already watched as he's been preaching. We've already observed as some people have already decided to go against Jesus Christ. But yet the work still goes on. And that's one thing that's always true. It doesn't matter who's against you or what circumstances or what things jump in the way. The work still must go on. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God, let's turn together the Gospel record of Mark in chapter 3. And notice with me, if you don't mind, in the Gospel record of Mark chapter 3, starting at verse number 7. The Gospel record of Mark chapter 3, and in verse number 7. The Bible says this, But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake unto his disciples that a small ship should wait on him, because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him, as many as had plagues. And the un- and unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, that they came unto him. And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have the power to heal sickness, and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, he surnamed them uh, Barnabas, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the Gospel record of Mark? The Gospel record of Mark in chapter number 3, and notice with me in verse number 14. Gospel record of Mark chapter 3 and verse 14. Notice the phrase, be with him. Be with him. Him. And with the Lord's help, I want to preach this idea from the gospel record of Mark, this idea to be with him. If you wouldn't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And I thank you so much that we've got to this place where we can open up the Bible, that we could see more from your word, and that we could be encouraged by your holy word. I'm asking that you would just give us grace and you would give us mercy, that you would just help us even now, that we can know more about you, that we can understand what your presence does, that it brings us closer to you, that we can have a knowledge of you. And because we're with you, that we could do those things that you've given us to do. I'm asking that you would set things in order tonight, that you would open up our understanding, that you would let us see what needs to happen and what our part in it, in your work, is to be. 
Thank you again. Fill me with your precious spirit. And that it would be your thoughts, your opinion, your desires that would come through and not my own. Again, you direct my path, direct my thoughts, direct my words. That you can be the help to folks that need to be helped. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, once again, we find ourselves traveling with Jesus Christ early in his earthly ministry. And as we come here, we see this idea to be with him. Now, this is key, understanding this passage, because we can see several things that are going on. The very first thing I'd like to show you in this passage is the great multitude. The great multitude. Turn with me, if you don't mind, to the gospel record of Mark chapter 3. And notice with me, starting at verse number 7. Gospel record of Mark chapter 3 and verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude. And when they heard what great things he did, came unto him. Notice two times in two verses, it mentions about this great multitude. In verse 7, it talks about this great multitude. In verse 8, it talks about this great multitude. So Jesus, as he's beginning this earthly ministry, more and more people are coming to him. More and more people are coming because they want to see these great things. They want to be healed. Tons of people who are sick are coming to see him. Many who are hopeless are coming to see him. Notice where they're coming from. They came from Galilee. Galilee is the area um, near the Sea of Galilee above Samaria. It says, and from Judea, this is going to be the southern kingdom area, this whole country. And from Jerusalem, from the capital city. And from Idiomia. Idiomia is going to be what we would say in the Old Testament is Edom. And so they came from Edom. And from beyond Jordan, if you're familiar with your map, this is where Moab and Amnon would, or Ammon would be at. And those that came from the other side of Jordan would come over. And they from Tyre and Sidon, this is going to be north north of that Galilee area. So you can see anyone coming from all of these areas, they're coming from the very north of the map. They're coming from the very west, east of the map. They're coming from the very south of the map. And they are coming and they're gathering together in a great multitude. If you could just imagine Jesus there and everywhere he went, Someone needed something. People needed healing. They needed salvation. They needed answers. They needed this. And Jesus, who is God, but he is God robed in an earthly body. He has made himself so at this period of time he could be only one place at once. And everyone's flocking to that one place. Notice again in verse number 9. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they throng him. So Jesus turned to the disciples that were with him and said, Hey, can you get me a small boat? And I want to go out to the sea or get in the boat and kind of push me out a little bit so that way I could teach. If you can imagine, people were so desperate to touch Jesus that while he's teaching, people are touching him. Now, I don't know how distracted you are or how easily distracted you are. Could you imagine trying to teach a great lesson? Imagine that you're trying to preach and as you're preaching, everyone's trying to touch you. Everyone wants to feel you. Teacher, teacher, I want your attention. I mean, it's bad enough to try to teach a class where the kids are barely paying attention. What do you do when they're all paying attention? And everyone wants to hear. They don't care about his message. They just want to touch him. Notice with me in verse number 10. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him to touch him as many as had plagues. So much for social distancing. Here's these people that had plagues. I mean, they're contagious. They've got all kinds of things. But they're thronging him because they got to touch him. They don't care who else is there. They just need to be healed. So in order for Jesus to teach anything, he had to be separate from the crowd. And so they put him on a boat and they pushed him out to sea just a little bit. So there was a little bit of distance so that way he could actually teach a message. But could you imagine this great multitude of people? Tons of people, and all of them need help. All of them need something. All of them. That is too much to handle. All these people, so much that even when the unclean spirits, when they saw him, they fell down before him, cried, said, Thou art the Son of God! 
Now, if you can imagine this scene, not only does everyone want to touch him, and it's not just clean people, it's grimy people. It's people with plagues all trying to touch him. Unwashed hands trying to touch him. Diseased hands trying to touch him. In the midst of it, you got people who are falling down and screaming and saying, Thou art the Son of God! And as the demons are being pulled from them, and verse number 11, And the unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Why is that? Doesn't Jesus want to be known by everyone? He does, but remember that at this moment, he's in the flesh. Not meaning that he <laughs> needs to be filled with the Spirit, meaning that he's robed in flesh. And there's only so much that he can do, even with this great multitude of people, as he's seeing them and trying to take care of their individual needs. There's only so much he could do. And if they go out advertising that, hey, there's more people to come. Everyone come. It's a practical thing that he can only do so much because of the great crowd. There's only so much that one person in a physical body can do. Which brings me to a second thing. Not only the great multitudes, but we also see the great call. The great call. Now because of this, Jesus had to do something practical. Notice what he does in verse number 13. And he, that's Jesus, goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. And he, that's Jesus, ordained, that means to choose, to anoint, to appoint. He ordained twelve. Why? That they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Now notice verse 14. Normally when we say according to the Bible, verse 14, why did Jesus call them? Well, because we look at the first part, we see the great multitudes. We immediately jump to the end sentence and try to get to where he's going. Hey, he called him to send him forth to preach. Think about this. All these great multitude, and he's trying to preach to all these people. He needs help, and there needs to be help. We need people to go out and preach. Yes, we understand we need people to go out and preach. But that is not why he called them to himself. Notice again in verse 14. And he ordained twelve. Why? That they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. So we know that there's a divine order. Before he could send them out to preach, before he could send them out to minister, before he could send them out to deal with a great multitude, they first had to be with him. The great call upon any Christian's life is the call to be with him. Him. Until you've been with him, you don't have anything to deliver to the masses because the masses, the great multitude, all these people that need help, they don't need you. You know what they need? They need Jesus. They don't need to hear what we have to say. They need to know what Jesus needs to say. They don't need our answers, our thoughts, and our opinions. They need what Christ has for them. So before we could deliver anything to the people, to the great multitudes, before we could be a help to all the things that need to be done, we first must be with him. And once we're with him and we start to get his heart, his desire, and they become our heart and our desire, that's when we could finally go out. It's not until we've been with him. If you don't mind, I'd like to show you this exact Thing in the life of Moses. Hold your finger here and turn with me to the Old Testament passage of Exodus. Exodus in chapter number 33. Exodus in chapter number 33. In Exodus chapter 33, it's dealing with Moses as he is preparing to deal with the people. Now, if you recognize the Bible, that right before this is when the great uh, sin occurred where the people built the golden calf. And so if you can imagine, two and a half million people had turned against God and started worshiping a false idol. After 40 days, uh, we'll get into this next uh, at the end of the year. But you know, the people heard 
God speak the Ten Commandments with their own ears. It wasn't that he told Moses and Moses told it. It wasn't that Moses came down with tablets and read it to them. They heard the Ten Commandments with their own ears. Then Moses went up to the mountain for another 40 days to get the plans for the tabernacle. And even after they heard the message from God's own mouth, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not have any graven image. Don't have any graven idols. Don't have anything like that. Don't have any pictures of the Lord or the pictures of anything that reflects about God and Jesus and whom he is. In 40 days time, they disobeyed. That's all it took. And now there's two and a half million people that God is currently angry with that even Moses himself is pretty upset with. And so Moses goes to God and says, God, I don't know how I'm going to deal with these people. How in the world am I going to deal with two and a half million murmuring, complaining, gossiping, ungrateful people who don't want to follow you? And God says, I know what you need. You need my presence. Moses, you can't do anything. It's my job. You need my presence. So notice with me, if you don't mind, this account in Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, and notice with me in verse 7. Uh, Verse 11, verse 11. Exodus 33, verse 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou shalt hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider this nation is thy people. So notice what Moses said. He says, before I leave these people, before I deal with them, I need to know you. I need to be with you is what he's saying. I need to know you. I need to know who you are. I need your presence. I need to know you before I could deal with these people. Notice verse 14. And he, that's God, said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Moses, you need a rest in me. It doesn't mean that Moses needs a vacation. It means that in order for Moses to be able to deal with the people and not be aggravated, he has to have God's presence, which gives him rest. As long as God is with him, he can face anything. He must have God's presence. He must be with God. Verse 15, And he said unto me, If thou... Thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Moses just said, hey, listen, if I don't have your presence, I can't do anything. That's true. Moses is admitting, God, if I don't have you with me, if I don't have your presence with me, I can't deal with these people. I I can't handle it. Verse number 16. For wherein shall it be known that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So we shall be separated. And verse 16, Exodus 33, 16, is the greatest biblical verse on biblical separation. That as we are with God, we will be separated from everything else that's not good in our life. We will be separated out. God will naturally push those things out of our life. Things I loved before have passed away. Things I loved far more have come to stay. Notice it again in verse 16. For where, when shall it be known that I, that here, <coughs> known here, that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, and all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And of course, Moses continues the conversation. But again, I want to bring you up to verse 13. What was Moses' great prayer? As he's dealing with two and a half million people, he's already led them out of Egypt. He's already led them through the Red Sea that has been parted with God's power. But he says, I can't deal with these people. 
But I, before I do, before I can even think about dealing with these, I must know you. I have to have your presence. I must be with you. The same principle that is true in Exodus 33 is exactly what is true in the gospel of Mark chapter 3. Turn back with me to the gospel of Mark in chapter 3. As we already said, what is the great calling upon the disciples' life? What is the great calling upon your life? The call to be with him. And once we've been with him, then we can deal with the great multitudes. We can deal with the other people. We are not equipped to deal with the other people until we have first been with him. That this needs to be a true principle. Before you could deal with your family, before you could deal with your coworkers, before you could deal with your enemies, before you could deal with the people you're trying to help, you must first be with him. Now I've been saying be with him quite a bit, but we need to understand the practicality of it. How is it that we be with him? Well, I'm glad that you asked. You understand that there is a very basic idea of the Christian life to be in God's presence and it's twofold. It's to read our Bibles and to pray. That when we read our Bibles, God speaks to us. He speaks to us primarily through His Word. And that everything that we do in our life needs to be based off the Word of God. That whether we speak with people or how we speak to people needs to be dealt with the Word of God. Whatever actions we do, whatever decisions we make in our life needs to be based off of the Word of God because that's how God speaks to us. And then If God speaks to us through his word, how do we speak to him if we want to have a conversation? Well, God has given us the medium of prayer to be able to be with him in prayer. You understand that this is not the idea. To be with him is not the idea that I read my chapter for today and I'm good. No, that's how to get through a minimum uh, Christianity where you're just crossing off boxes and just saying, well, I've done my duty. God's not looking for you to read the Bible because it's your duty. He wants you to read your Bible because you want to know Him. You understand, if you approach your Bible with that mentality, God, teach you me more about who you are, your Bible reading will be revolutionized. It's no longer an academic matter. It's a spiritual matter where you're dwelling with the presence of God. When you approach God in prayer and say, God, I want to be with you. I don't want to just give you a laundry list. I want to talk with you. I want to have a conversation. Lord, be with me in my prayer and let me know you through prayer. Your prayers change. It gets to the place where you don't want to quit to pray. We all get to the place where we've all been to the place where, all right, I'll just say my token prayer and I'll say this. But when you're in God's presence, you don't want to quit praying. When you're in God's presence, you don't want to quit reading your Bible. That's what we're looking for, is being with Him. And it's so good and so sweet, and you don't want to quit. You need to have God's presence. It's not until you've been with Him in prayer. It's not until you've been with Him in your Bible reading. Are you even equipped to deal with anything else? Our walk with the Lord must precede our dealing with man. The great multitude is great. There is a lot of work that needs to be done. But none of us are equipped to do the Lord's work until we've been with Him. That is the open secret. You're not equipped. You're not qualified. You're not prepared to deal with anyone else until you've been with Him. And once you've been with him, then you could go do the work that God's given you to do. Again, notice verse 14. And he, that's Jesus, ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. They had to be with him before they could go out and preach to the great multitudes. So first of all, we understand here the great multitude. There's a lot of work to do. People have come from all over the place to be with Jesus. And him in physical form, there were so many people it needed help to do that. So he ordained 12 to be with him. So that way they could in turn help him with the great multitudes. Which brings me to the last thing here. The great 
need for laborers. The great need for laborers. What we have here starting at verse 16 through 19 is the calling of the 12 disciples. Why did Jesus call the 12? What was the purpose? Because the work is great. There's a great need for laborers. The job is bigger than one person. Let me tell you the job is bigger than one person in the Green Bay area. We need laborers. One person is not enough. One person is not enough to reach all of Oneida. That's not how it works. We need laborers in the field. And before they could go out and labor in the field, they first got to be with him. The work is great. So many people need help. So many people need help. People who study such thing understand that a structure of any organization limits how many people they can help. Imagine if you wouldn't mind, maybe you have a sewing company. Maybe you're putting together some cute little bobbles or a bear or a giraffe, button eyes. All right, you're going to put it together. The idea of the organization of a structure limits how many people you could successfully serve. So let's say that it takes all day to make a giraffe. You know, if you're working at full capacity all by yourself, the most you can do and that's even pushing it, would be 356 giraffes in one year. You're limited. And so if you got an order for a thousand, you could not accomplish that on your own in a timely fashion. And so you need laborers to get the job done. Well, let me tell you, we have something more important than little giraffes with button eyes. There are people who are dying and going to hell. And one person cannot reach The city alone. It takes great laborers to be with them. Laborers to work out and reach the multitude. People who have real needs and real issues. And so what do we need? We need laborers in the harvest field. Where do these laborers come from? They come from those people who have decided to be with him. That's the great call in your life. To be with him. And then once you've been with him. Once you've been abiding in your presence. Then God can use you to help work with a great multitude. There's a great need out there. And we need laborers. But it's not the idea of just putting laborers in a spot. Because we need warm bodies. The very first call on anyone's life. Is to be with him. Let me tell you, every Christian worth his salt should have a desire to be used of God in some capacity. Maybe you say, I don't know what I can do. I'm not trained. I'm not equipped. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Let me tell you the very first thing you need to do is to be in your Bible and to be in your prayer and not just read it as a duty, but read it to the idea to be with him. And as you're with him, you start to get his desire. As you're with him, you start to have his thoughts. Once you're with him, you start to understand his plan. Once you're with him, you start to understand how he wants it to be done. Once you're with him, you understand how you're supposed to speak and deal with others. But the open secret, in order to reach the people, in order to reach the great multitude, in order to start touching the great need that's around us, it begins here to be with him. And so let me ask you, dear friend, just a simple couple questions. How is your Bible reading? When you read your Bible today, was it dry and academic? Was it just words on a page? Or did you get to spend time with God through his precious word? Were you seeking him? Were you closer to God? Did you understand more about who God is because of your Bible reading? Let me tell you, that's the way it should be. How about your prayer life? Even if you got a chance to pray, was it more of a -a rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for this grub, or later on tonight, now I lay me down to sleep? Or was it that you had a conversation with him, and you spoke with him, and you told him about 
what he has been teaching you? Have you been learning more about him through his word by spending time with him and being in his presence? And that just saying, I just want to be with you. You understand this is where it has to begin. This is where it needs to change. If you want to be used of God, it has to start with you being with him. And the more that you're with him, the more that you could be used by him. I know some people say, preacher, you only got one message and you just repeat it over and over. Read your Bible, read your Bible, pray, pray, pray. And you know why? Because that's the greatest thing you could do on a daily basis is to be in the Word of God for yourself. You know why we repeat it? It's because you're not in your Bible. You know why I keep saying it over and over? Because you need to be in your Bible. Yes, you. You know why I keep saying you need to pray, you need to pray, you need to pray? Because you haven't got the praying down yet. You have to be with him. It has to be something you look forward to. Instead of something you have to force yourself into. It has to be something you desire. To be reading your Bible. Instead of something that you feel pressured or guilted into doing. The idea to be with him. And until you've been with him. You are not equipped to deal with other people. The first call on any Christian's life is the call to be with him. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.